welcome to episode 187. 187. Finally, finally, after 186 shows, in the next one, we're going to have a conversation about the U.S., in particular, the U.S. Department of Ed National Educational Technology Plan that came out recently in 2024. Zach Chase and Susan Burden are both going to chat with us about the report. I've got various questions. I actually got some questions from chat, chat PDF. I've also got some questions from my students. My class just ended 15 minutes ago. I jumped in my car, went through a red light, literally it did, and then went through three green lights and I got here in time to start this broadcast. So um, I don't want to go through their bios point by point, but I will say that they're, it's impressive what projects they've been working on. And apparently Zach was involved in the previous version of this report. So maybe uh, we'll start with Zach to get us up to speed with what happened between report one, and report two, and, and a bit more of his bio. And then we'll go to Susan in her bio a bit. And then both Young and I will be asking questions of you. So, um, Zach, would you like to kind of prepare us for what the conversation might be about um, and, and fill us in a bit with your bio? Why? why how, how did a person like you, or was in a school district, all of a sudden become in charge of such an important report for the whole country. Um, did you know somebody? Um, did you donate <laughs> a lot? Of, did you donate a lot of money somewhere? I mean, uh, or are you just really a smart guy? Well, we'll, we'll, uh, well I, I'm not going to claim any of those things. Um, the right place at the right time, I think, is probably probably the correct answer. Yeah. So um, my background, I will also not go bullet point by bullet point, but. Um, worked as a classroom teacher and uh, as an instructional technology coordinator, a curriculum coordinator, um, and uh, coordinator of library and media services at, at the district level. And then also had um, the opportunity to serve as a fellow in the um, Obama administration during the writing of the 2016 plan. Um, and I, I think that that piece, it's interesting the way that you put it, I think that hopefully part of the value that I uh, or background that I bring uh, to the to the development of these documents is that experience as a practitioner, um, and and being able to say and and listening hopefully as closely as possible, and hopefully Susan will talk a bit of this as well to the field and asking kind of what is the guidance that that we need and what are the problems that we're that we're facing that we need to solve most immediately and what kind of solutions um, can be the most helpful to the field. So hopefully that 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 background um, helped to tune tune me into those voices um, and and saying, okay, what is practical here? Um, so yeah, that's my background is, is one of a practitioner um, and have had the experience to be a, a fellow in the Department of Ed um, in the Obama administration and then um, applied and interviewed for this fellowship um, and, and was selected. So yeah, that's the, you, the long and the short of how I got here. Were you trained in instructional technology? Um, and if so, where? Um, so yes, um, I don't have a degree in instructional technology, um, but was hired um, out of, uh, hired as an instructional technology coordinator when I lived in Colorado. Uh, very interesting where I started my career in Sarasota, Florida, um, and our superintendent there had a, a pretty strong belief in the potential of technology to transform learning and teaching. And um, so started a program with a small cohort of teachers, kind of a train the trainer model, that was a two year intensive um, that brought in uh, different prax uh, practical um, researchers, um, also um, kind of said, here are the tools we, we are thinking of equipping all of our classrooms with. This is before we had gone one to one kind of as a nation. Um, and so I had a two year intensive in my third and fourth years uh, in the classroom um, that later on when I did my master's work, I thought, oh, that, that was a master's program that I that wasn't that wasn't called a master's program. Um, and then went on and and got a master's in educational policy and leadership and then one in curriculum and instruction. Where were those at? Uh, policy uh, and management was at the Harvard uh, Ed School and then curriculum and instruction through Nova Southeastern University. Right. So you probably know Chris Didi. I, I do. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Did you have classes with him? I did not. No, I couldn't get into Chris's class. <laughs> All of them seem to be end up in some high-level position somewhere around the world. Um, 
So uh, we'll go over to Susan now. Uh, give us some of your background and your input into the report. Sure. Well, I also was a classroom teacher. Uh, I was actually a music teacher, strings and orchestra, uh, for six and a half years uh, before I made the transition into technology. And I was a K-12 technology director at an independent school in Florida for eight years. And I think that experience, I always viewed my job as an IT leader, I viewed our, our department as a service organization. In other words, our job was to help everybody else at the organization do their jobs better, whether that was a teacher, whether that was a student, whether that was administrative staff, that was our job. And I think I really bring that lens very strongly to this work. Uh, when I, in 2016, I also had a fellowship at the U.S. Department of Education. In fact, I literally came right after Zach I inherited his desk and his laptop. <laughs> <laughs> so I was at the department for a year. And uh, during that time, I led the um, up the 2017 update of uh, building K-12 infrastructure for learning, which is was the department's uh, K-12 IT infrastructure guide. So I also came to this project with some experience having uh, written a long doc government document before. Uh, and uh, but I think it was a uh, helpful perspective. It, when, it, when, the, when the original NETP came out, it was published when I was at OET. And I did some minor contributions uh, to it. This was after Zach had left, but it was really exciting for me to be able to come back around and actually work on the 2024 update. Uh, it was just a really nice kind of closing of the loop for me. So both of you are battle-scarred veterans and have been with the, the re, this particular report over a, a period of time. Um, can you give us a sense of what's changed from the last report to this report, the focus, um, the mission, the message that you have? I, I wrote down this afternoon as I was reading the report, What's their what's what would be their message that they want to give in terms of this report, but back up from that, before we get into message, what has changed between the two reports and and in, in emphasis uh, and so forth? Well, globally, we've experienced a pandemic. Um, and, and so there's that piece to it. Um, and in that pandemic, as we all know, uh, and your audience well knows, we kind of shifted the definition of educational technology and some folks had to equate to emergency remote learning um, because those were all of the kind of pro proliferation of resources and pedagogies and practices that we had been kind of diligently working toward as a field for, for a number of decades, all of a sudden came to mean doing school at home on a computer in an emergency setting, right? Um, and so that is a, that is a shift. Um, so I, part of my hope is that this 2024 plan uh, is is a recentering and a reminder of the potentials of these technologies in expanding our abilities um, to help all students learn. So I, I think that that would be a, a piece there. I would also say that this plan is different than those that have come before it in its focus on uh what are key what are key problems and what are potential solutions? Mm -hmm. um, I am a nerd and I feel like I'm probably in good company here. I know Susan, I think, would probably admit to being a nerd. Um, right. So I've read, have read the previous plans. And in 1996, when the when the first NETP came out, um, there were some some areas of focus, right? They said, we should probably get all schools and classrooms connected. We should probably get some devices in those classrooms. We should probably get some resources to run on those devices. And we should probably work on professional learning so that all teachers are able to use that connectivity, those devices, and those resources. And if you look at the difference between the 2016 plan and the 2024 plan and the state of the country, because of that pandemic, we have gotten much closer to equity of connectivity access to devices and access to resources, right? So the, the where we are now compared to where that we were when that 2016 plan com, came out, as a field, we have much greater access to connectivity devices and resources. 
What we didn't have time, space, or capacity for was building and giving teachers the ability to build their their capacities to use those tools um, in thoughtful ways that were that uh, allowed them to to design for multiple learners and multiple needs in the same setting um, to realize that potential. Now that that we have are much closer to closing that that initial access divide. Before we go to Susan and Young here, so in my re reflection, it's you've moved beyond just defining terms, which often you we read in the old reports. What is what something is, yes, and, to to solving problems, yes. And, and I w just will point out as an aside, ERT uh, is not a term that's looked on favorably within the ed tech or community or learning design technology community, but we, it was a needed term for a time and we, mm -hmm. you know, we need to move beyond. It was, it was, it was welcomed briefly and then a lot of people threw up on the term and uh, were moved on to, to moving on to uh, more thoughtful uses of, of new technologies for critical thinking, creative thinking and so forth. And not just, sure. yeah. If I, if I, a piece that you, you touched on, I think is important. The, the solution oriented and kind of problem solution oriented approach is in response to what we also heard from the field, um, right? So we had a, a fantastic um, group of folks from uh, Learning Forward and Project Tomorrow who did a number of listening sessions, virtual listening sessions across multiple audiences. Uh, and so those were listening sessions for those who are kind of not in that realm of lingo is just a, a focus group, right? Where we ask the same questions of those of those folks. And then a number of one-on-one -on -one interviews with uh, leaders from the field. Uh, and then we opened it up to uh, surveys to the public uh, by audience. And we, we took these ideas as we were kind of uh, getting that information back. We took those to different conferences and said, this is what we're thinking based on what we're hearing from the field. And what the field said was, we need examples and we need solutions. Uh, and so this document, in reference to your previous question, is hopefully bringing that to the field is kind of here are examples from every state in the country is has an example at least one example in the field uh guam puerto rico juvenile justice and dc are all represented because we also wanted to say good work is happening i think sometimes especially post pandemic it can feel like uh nobody it can feel as though you know everything is going wrong and this report i think hopefully says everywhere across this country People are doing the right things to make things better. I've got a question later about that because that's exactly, well, related to my, uh, another question I have. We need to, Young needs to get in a question at some point, but Susan, you want to add add to what Chase, has, Zach has said? Sure. I think another challenge that was brought about by the pandemic was while there was, while there were a lot more devices that we came closer to, uh, closing, narrowing the access divide in terms of student access to internet connectivity and devices. I think because technology was deployed as in such an emergency remote way, as Zach said, people came to view technology use as being emergency remote learning. And I think that that actually has had, an, people have a negative impression of technology now because of the pandemic, because that technology was used in ways, because it was deployed so quickly on an emergency basis. It wasn't deployed with enough time. <laughs> Teachers didn't have the time, space, capacity to learn how to use the technology meaningfully. It was like, okay, it's Friday and next Monday, you're gonna be teaching all your classes online. Good luck. I mean, that is literally how it happened in a lot of places. And so I think a lot of people, while there may have been some facility gained in terms of like how to use a learning management system or um, how to, you know, post, you know, homework assignments online. There wasn't time. Teachers didn't have the time to really adjust their pedagogy to be working in an online environment. And that's a very different skill than teaching in a classroom. And in some places, teachers were having to teach both in-person and online classes at the same time, which completely blows my mind. Um, and I tried doing that once just at a conference where we had a workshop where we had uh, in we had an in-person group and then we had some folks online and 
just that one experience made me just made me realize even more how unbelievably difficult that must have been for teachers and how difficult it is to be effective when you're basically working for two different, very different audiences who have very different needs at that moment and what they need for their hour. learning. <laughs> I yes. just did that. <laughs> and and, so, and it, yeah, I know what you're saying. <laughs> okay. So I think that uh, when we were putting together the plan, we really wanted it to, to focus on the learning. I think that is something that we tried very hard to do is in addition, Zach mentioned that it's very actionable. Each section starts with recommendations. That was intentional. In the previous NETP, the recommendations were at the back of each section. We wanted the recommendations to be up front. And we also, the order of we, the NETP talks about the three digital divides, the digital use divide, the digital design divide, and the digital access divide. That order was intentional because so often people are used to thinking of putting the access divide first. However, well, yes, it is true. Access is a baseline requirement to use technology. We didn't want people to start with the access. We wanted them to start with the why. Why are you using the technology? And then build from there. Young, you want to jump in here? Uh, yeah, I, I think, uh, uh, well, thanks, Zach and Susan. Uh, you know, you, you guys are very special because we always run this show on Saturdays. And uh we won't, but we. This is the only time we made it Friday. That's why the other uh, two co-hosts cannot join us, you know. But well, it gives me the great opportunity to just chat with uh, you know, three people. Otherwise, it'd be very crowded, you know. So, so this is uh, this is beautiful. And, and really, um, my question more has to do with uh, uh, the U.S. Department of Education, you know, because uh, you guys both work there. You know, uh, I still work with. Uh, with Linda, you know, I can a long time ago, you know, it's uh she's on the board uh, of uh, Digital Promise. I'm on the board, so we've been work we work uh, quite often, and I've been thinking a lot about, um, you know, we every few years we go through this very meaningful and interesting exercise of developed NETP. So Kurt, you, you're wrong. You're wrong. I shouldn't call it a report. It's a national education technology plan. It's not a report of the past, it's a plan for the future. Mm -hmm. and, and I mean, you, you spend a lot of time, you bring a lot of uh, experts, all kinds of people in this, as practically minded as both of you are, you know, you think about, uh, you should have much broader impact than it has. So, so this is, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's in some ways quite, quite sad to say and the NETB, does not have a broader impact on the national, you know, technology uh, activities or investment. So, so I was just wondering uh, if within the Department of Education, which I haven't been there for a long time, it's been going on. There's a lot of interest in this happening in DC, but you know, I'm, you, you, I'm glad you have the courage to be hang out there. But anyway, so the the <laughs> just just think about uh, the. Uh, so what's the department uh, beyond the uh, the Office of Tech Educational Technology? Are they interested in promoting this? Or are they aligned with the uh, recommendations, the suggestions? Uh, I, I know there are certain things you're not supposed to talk about. So so don't don't violate anything, you get fired. You know, most important, keep your job. Anyway, so 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 what what's the I, I think our audience would be very much interested in knowing that. I, I think that Susan can probably I hope will will nod along with this one. Um there is um I think there's great value in doing this a second time, um, right? So in, in that first piece, getting a piece of, of government policy, a government publication out the door, the the focus is just on learning the process, right? So there are just so many working pieces that are involved there. Um, so doing this a second time, I think, has been incredibly valuable in understanding how to navigate that. I think that the other piece there is that we have had a number of different offices across the department that have been interested in supporting the work um, and then also making sure that as we were drafting it, it wasn't a piece that just our Office of Educational Technology owned, but that it was one that we sought input. Um, so I talked a little bit earlier about seeking input from the field in general, um, but making sure that we sought input as we were going through. In fact, when we released the document on, in January on January 22nd, we co the department co-released two other um, uh, resources. So one was from our Office of Special Education Programs, 
around myths and uh, facts of uh, assistive technology. There's a strong thread of accessibility, assistive technology, assist, uh, uh, accessible educational materials, and UDL um, across this version of the NETP. Uh, and so what our, our colleagues over at OSEP did was publish something that said, there, yeah, uh, how do we, there it is. Um, how do we make sure that um, that isn't just a plan, but there are practical pieces of guidance that are going into the field at the same time, right? Like, what are the resources to support the folks who are, are doing this piece? The other piece that came out is um, there's a, res a resource that hopefully um, we can post with this episode um, of uh, digital health, safety, and citizenship resources from across the federal government. Um, so uh, there are a number of different resources that have been built by Health and Human Services, uh, the CDC, a number of different agencies are building things that I know and, and Susan knows as, as practitioners doing this work would be very helpful to schools and districts. And we know that ed tends to be the conduit by which um, uh, schools and districts get information. So we wanted to, to kind of make sure we were channeling that and making that that more accessible. So I would say that is a key piece of this is that we were talking to other offices as we were developing the plan to, to make sure that those ideas uh, lined up and that other offices said we can support and, then, and, um, and, and in fact, we're able to support within the release. Um, I, I would also say that this has been... Um, Right, so the 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 president has spoken about um, uh, device access and the affordable connectivity program. Right, this has been a focus of the administration at large. That access divide. Um, the president has shown great concern around the issues of mental health and device access and those kinds of pieces. So that this is a this is a piece that the administration um, outside of Ed has been focusing on. So that there is that willingness as well. The other piece I would say is that we realize that the publication of the plan is not the end of the conversation, but the beginning of the conversation. Um, as much as easy as easy it would be to say, you know, we've spent a year and a half of our lives building this thing. Now we just set it free and everyone will, will read it and love it. We wanted to make sure that we were then fostering the conversations that were happening. So we've we've talking with we've spoken with folks in the industry, we've spoken with districts, we've spoken with states. I had a conversation with the state leaders of assistive technology and education uh, the other day. I've, uh, we've had some partnership uh, webinars with CAST and COSIN. So kind of across the field, we're talking about these ideas because the conversation is the next piece. The last piece I'll say on this, Young, because I didn't mean to go so long on that, but it is a piece that I that we were very mindful of as we were developing the plan, uh, is that the the there are a number of different appendices to this document. Uh, and that is on purpose. One, the first four appendices are our first appendices are collections. <laughs> Kurt, you're great with the visual aids. I love it. Uh, the first appendices are all kind of collections of examples we just didn't have room for in the main body of the document, but wanted to make sure it got highlighted. The last four appendices are what we kind of think is quick start guides, um, because we recognize also not everybody's going to want to pick up a hundred page um, or like print and collate like Kurt did, uh, a hundred page federal policy document. So those two pages are hopefully what, what folks might take into a faculty meeting or a staff meeting um, that they might bring up in a conference, right? So we there's one for state education leaders, district education leaders, building education leaders and educators um, who may not serve in a formal leadership role to say, if you only read two pages, read these. And our hope is that those start the conversation. Right. So if you are unfamiliar with the idea of the universal design for learning framework, those two pages get your toes wet. And then you think, well, I might want to read more about this part of the report and jump right in. Um, so we're trying to find better ways to communicate and market this um, plan in ways that are accessible to the folks who are needing those supports. Susan, you want to add to that? Sure, I'd say another thing that we thought a lot about in this plan was the importance of systems. Uh, we really, the, the NETP is really geared at system level leaders, or I should say folks who can make an impact at the systemic le level. So state leaders, uh, district leaders, fe federal policymakers, state policymakers, and building level leaders. I think educators could definitely get a lot out of the plan, but what we were really trying to do was focus on how to create the systems that make the meaningful implementation of technology 
in education possible. And so often folks are in a rush to get the technology into the classrooms, but teachers aren't given the time to reflect on their practice. They may be given, you know, a brief professional development session on a professional development day, but then that's it. It's where the, where the PD may be focused on how to use a tool, like the nuts and bolts of using it, but not how to use it meaningfully to <laughs> enhance instruction <laughs> and improve student learning. So, and those are two different things. So I think that is something that we thought a lot about was how, uh, how can we recognize the importance of creating these systems that allow these things to happen, that provide educators and administrators with the time, space, and resources that they need to improve their professional practice. So, so this is, an, uh, go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry, Kurt, I just want to follow up with that. Uh, you guys, you know, they, uh, remember back in it under Clinton, you know, that's many, 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 many years ago. And um, I think technology was, uh, uh, was, backed up with funding. Remember that time? So, so I was just wondering, uh, uh, both Susan and Zach, if uh, if this plan, you know, it's always big if we can go get funding. Of course, funding, especially grant funding has been gone to different places. You know, the department does not operate a lot of uh, direct you know, grant anymore. So I was wondering if you guys have ever talked about uh, connect this with some funding, you know, you think about equity, you think about access, think about the future, think about AI. I mean, this is a big challenging time. It's truly really revolutionizing, you know, with the generative AI coming to schools. And so was there any discussion about uh, potentially funding uh, some of the ideas or use the ideas to guide potential funding for K-12 schools? I did. I promised myself I wasn't going to start talking while I was on mute, and then I went ahead and I was the one. I was the sacrificial one on this on this episode. I uh, so um, it's a great question, and it comes up pretty often. Uh, the Office of Educational Technology has no grant making or or funding authority uh, built into it. In fact, part of what we were established to do was to write NETP. It was it was built in uh, to the statute. That said, one of the pieces that we've been talking, and I think part of what you're talking about is the E2T2 uh, program um, that I think was so powerful in helping to shift the field and helping the states get their their legs under themselves that um, there's, that, it, uh, that funding has sunset. Um, I think that that there is definitely space for the field to 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 muster a call to that if if the field thinks that is that is necessary and 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 valuable one of the pieces we've been looking at is and and the office of edtech has published and and then updated recently in last year uh, a dear colleague letter laying out all the allowable uses of federal funds that are currently available to support educational technology um, efforts, right? So Title II, Title IV-A, these are all funds that, that have technology um, uses and allowances built into them. The, the thing that, we, that we're hoping to start or that we are starting as far as a conversation is don't just purchase the technology, to Susan's point, right? Or purchase the technology professional development, but how could you say, we are only going to use these funds in ways that that kind of support technology, content, and practice, right? So that those three things are are thought of as building teacher capacity at the same time. Um, I think that when we just buy technology, we end up with what Susan was talking about. We end up with a lot of technology, and we haven't necessarily thought through how that um, how that coordinates with with practice and and usage and design and those kinds of pieces. Um, so. I would, I would say that there are probably some reimaginings of how funding can be used that is currently there in ways that are perhaps more effective to, to getting that design uh, moving forward. I, I think that one of the pieces, we have a couple of examples, right? So there's one out of Denver Public Schools, right? And so Denver Public Schools stopped doing one-off technology uh, professional learning um, and worked in agreement with their local teachers union to say that you will also engage in a full cycle of professional coaching 
following the completion of any of these workshops on technology, right? So that didn't require a new influx of funds. It was a, it was a rethinking or a, a greater efficiency of the use of the current funds that are out there. Um, the Illinois uh, School Board um, has a program through their TLC that works largely with rural schools that don't have the budget capacity for a full-time technology coach where there's a cost sharing that's developed there that, that says, all right, what's the change you're trying to make? Maybe you don't necessarily need a full-time technology coach right now, but that there's a cost sharing with the state that says, what's the change you're trying to make Then budgets out those hours. And so they're, they're doing, and what they have seen is that then districts see that and say, okay, there might be a better way for us to think through this, that maybe we can re um, adjust how we're using those current funds to increase the impact or the efficiency of what's going on. Um, and then I think uh, 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 Brigantine uh, School District in New Jersey, I, I think Susan, I, sometimes I get all these examples incorrect. What they did there was say, we need to increase our staff's capacity to use these things. They, they really understood the need for that professional learning. And so they didn't say, what more can we add? They stopped and said, systemically, how can we readjust and, and re I think the example of money is important, but I think we'd also like an influx of more time, but we can't do that one. We know that one, like we can't put another hour in the day. And so I think what Brigantine did was super important because they said, how can we adjust how we think about the use of these things in ways that increase the opportunities for what students are doing that doing during that time, and then use that free time for our educators in ways that improve their capacity and take the load off. So yeah, it would be fantastic. Um, and, and there are certainly, we're always looking for ways to, to fund and prioritize um, effective use of, of technology and teaching practices. I think that to say this is only possible with new money um, discounts the works that the work that districts and schools across the country are, are making it happen by saying we can, we can perhaps be more efficient and thoughtful uh, about working on this. Uh, Justin Wright, uh, and um, John Mehta, who were on our technical working group, um, uh, had also um, just completed a, a, a series thinking through um, the book Subtract, um, which thinks about subtraction as a key design principle. Uh, and so that certainly in, influenced our thinking about this. Too. What can we stop? Uh, what are some things that technology has maybe made outdated? This is certainly a part of um, the conversation about AI as we're moving forward, right? So what are the inefficiencies that are there that we just haven't stopped doing um, that we could remove to create greater space for, for these other things that we need to prioritize? Justin was my first contact when reading this report, and he led us to both of you. So, uh, so that, yeah. Yeah. Um, and we have had a couple of shows about time, uh, one recently that, that Young set up. Susan, do you want to comment on this question that Young proposed? I agree that time is probably one of the greatest challenges, but yet it's one of the most critical. And so I'm, I can't wait to go back and listen to your episodes about time because <laughs> this is something Zach and I feel very strongly about. Um, I believe that that educators want to do their best, but it's very hard for them often in the way that systems are set up. You were, you know, you hear so many teachers say, it's just one more thing. And I've never heard a teacher complain about having something taken off their plate, not once. <laughs> and I think that so happens, what often happens is that uh, in many districts, you end up getting initiative fatigue where teachers are expected to do this new thing. And then that's the latest thing for a year or two. And then a new leader comes in and then, oh, no, we're going to do this initiative that's going to, you know, totally revamp education. And then teachers have to jump through a whole series of new hoops. And then someone else comes in and there's another new initiative that they have to do. And then that's just something else that they have to learn. We really are hoping that schools will sit back and think holistically about the skills that they want students to graduate with and how can the edu education process help students develop those skills throughout the K-12 cycle and how can technology help those students do so? Zach, was there anything else you wanted to add? So no. Zach, Zach, you mentioned something political and this is an apolitical show, but from time to time we embed some comments 
Um, I will mention that uh, one of my former students, Kurt Squire, is at UC Irvine. His wife is there too. His name you might know is at Constance Steinkuhler. And in the Obama administration, she was kind of put in charge of gamification of US and other things. And apparently Biden came into the, I read her blog post about this. Biden came into one of her meetings and purposely extended the time of the meeting because he absorbed everything that she had to say and wanted more and more and more. That's, that's, that's a good sign. Uh, that's all I'm saying is when a, a, a leader is asking to, to learn more about the educational technology field, that that's, bodes well for, for education. But so I'll ask a question that relates to that somewhat. And that was the question I had this afternoon when going through this report before my class, about noontime before my class. Um, it's about what message do you want people to get from this report? And so if I flew both of you in here to Indiana, and I, I said, you have one of five possible audiences to tell what the message is, okay? And you can pick your audience. The audience could be Indiana teachers, audience could be educational leaders and politicians, audience could be um, students, audience could be uh, K-12 students, audience could be parents, and the fifth audience could be my educational technology graduate students. So graduate students, parents, K-12 students, leaders and politicians or teachers, pick any of those audiences and what message do you want the report to give to, to them? What, what you know, just short, not, nothing lengthy. What, what, what is the message here? I, I think I'm, I'm laughing because I think in the last couple of weeks, I've spoken to each of those five audiences uh, okay. about this. So uh, luckily, I have, by the way, I, let me let me just say I have to hold this up. It's, it's a single camera view. So this is the report that we're talking about. It's thick. You can print it out or you can get the digital version, but I recommend it highly. Well, I'll come back. My other question is going to relate to this as well. So I just had flashed the report up here. Go ahead. I think a piece that I'm going to pick up on, on Susan's previous answer, because I think it's incredibly important. Those who are in charge of leading systems. Um, and so it's a little bit of a hedge to your to your question, but I think it's an important one, is that the systems can allow for this kind of transformative learning experience for all students. Um, and so um, the message that I would send is that we can stand back and say, one, do we have a vision for the active use of technology by all students? And if we have that vision, then we back up and say, have we developed equitable systems of support so that all educators can design learning experiences that allow for that equitable active use? And then I would back it up a step after that and say, have we envisioned learning environments, digital and physical, that are built and designed in such a way to support educators in delivering those learning experiences and support students in carrying out those learning experiences? So starting, starting with where we're hoping to go for students and then saying, have we aligned every piece of our systems to making that type of learning possible for all students, right? So in, in the 2016 report, Young will probably remember, we, we talked about for the first time, the digital use divide, right? And so this is the divide between students who, uh, traditionally students from historically marginalized backgrounds are asked to do more passive things with technology than their peers. And there's a growing body of research that says that that passive use of technology has a negative or neutral effect on learning outcomes. Every student deserves creation, production, analysis, collaboration, um, uh, working with real world experts across the, every student deserves that, right? So that's that's a baseline of, of kind of outputs. But with this, this report also says all students, no matter their abilities or disabilities, deserve that kind of access, right? So it's it's not necessarily historical uh, marginalization, but it's and included in that, I think, historically, our students with disabilities, but that all students deserve those pieces. And if we want that, if that is our vision, and I think that by and large, folks will agree they want all students to be able to achieve and to grow and to have the brightest futures possible. If that is what we want, then we need to say, are we investing 
time and supports and systems in giving educators everything they need to make that possible. Um, and that goes from either supports and professional learning. And I, it's funny because we talk about UDL and we talk about, you know, getting teachers comfortable with using more than one tool to teach a concept at the same time. And I, I mentioned that in, in one interview and, and a teacher afterward pulled me aside and said, I'm really comfortable with that. But when my principal comes through, they're not comfortable with seeing kids doing different things. And so I have to admit my language is every educator understanding that not every student has to be using the same tool at the same time to do the learning that's possible. And so if we aren't supporting systems in that way and saying, have we made sure every teacher can do this and that they have the time to learn how to do this, then we're not going to get there. And if we don't have the spaces that engender this kind of thoughtful design and creativity, then we're not going to get there. So that those would be my messages. Right. They, are, are we are we making sure we have all kids using it? Are we making sure all teachers can do what they need to do and want to do? And then are we making sure that the spaces, digital and physical, are designed in such ways that that allow for those two groups of folks to do those amazing things? We've had shows on spaces as well. I can send you, Susan and Chase, I'll look for those. I made a mistake. I think you wouldn't have to fly here to Indiana. I think you live in Chicago and could drive down. Is that right? I'm I'm in Illinois. I'm not in Chicago, but I, I am in Illinois. So yeah, I could I could just we I'll just head over after we wrap. What city are you in? in I'm in uh, Springfield, Illinois. Oh, in Springfield, not not that far. My friends. Okay, yeah. we'll talk. Well, Susan, per, was one of the groups that you talked about state policymakers. Yeah, and, and education leaders, yeah. Okay, because I would say, because we're talking about systems, I would take everything that Zach <laughs> just communicated <laughs> and I would take that message and communicate it to state and, and federal policymakers, but I think especially state policymakers because I think states have a much greater impact on the direct environment in which schools operate and educators teach and students learn. Because I think there is a great misunderstanding when we talk about technology and education. There's a lot of people who think that it's about using learning management system. And yes, there are definitely certain digital literacy skills. Like I think there's tremendous value in K-12 students understanding how to use a learning management system. But that's not what we're really talking about in the plan. We're really talking about exactly what Zach was saying about how technology can be used to create meaningful learning experiences for all students, regardless of their ability, their background. Um, and how can state leaders create policies and Approve, appropriate funding that makes that possible. Because so often, you know, you may have, you may, you may be, have, be say, be, able to, uh, be a building direct, building level leader, for instance, and you may have a lot of ideas about what you would like to see happening in your school, but you are restricted by the con larger context in which you're working. In other words, the district policies, the state policies led by the state. So I would want to know how could state leaders in Indiana create and support the system that, <laughs> that allow teachers to do the kind of teaching that we would like to see happen. Right. Young, you want to jump in here? Yeah, I mean, I think they are. Uh, by the way, thanks, Susan and Zach, for, for your great answers. Is uh, uh, And, and uh, Springfield is a good place to live. I live in by Springfield in Oregon, so... Uh, and I used to, I went to grad school at uh, Urbana-Champaign, so we we're quite Oh, close. sure. Yeah, so uh, Lincoln's uh, old house, I think it's still in Springfield, right? It's very much That's so. That's right. But, uh, so, so the interesting thing is, is that, um, you know, what COVID did is in essence, almost created a global learning environment. In essence, like, you know, mm -hmm. you, you might still be, I mean, operationally, it was schooling, but technically, once you go online, it's global. You, the students don't have to take the course from the Springfield District or, or, or Champaign District or Bloomington. And, uh, and so now, technically, again, with AI and other tools, 
uh, we would make the argument, uh, actually Richard Elmore, uh, the late Richard Elmore from Harvard told me that learning has then escaped the classroom. Learning has escaped the classroom. And Kurt, you, you've seen this. We've, we have students from Nepal taking MOOCs and learning English and learning everything else. You know, So, so I was just wondering, not really necessarily from the Department of Education's perspective, but really from your personal perspective, uh, uh, Susan, Zach, is that uh, how much do you see schools and teachers liberating, allowing their students to learn on their own? You know, we kept talking about personalization of learning and no teacher can truly personalize for students. Personalization has to be done by students. So have you seen a lot of good examples, school districts, schools, teachers enabling their students to learn on their own with technology and really not imposing their own instruction. Can you give some examples? I think that'd be, that'd be wonderful to, to think about. I've got, an, I've got an example that comes to mind from the, the plan that, that I think is, actually I've got two, I'll give you two. Uh, one is a, is a school in Mississippi that we highlight. Um, and we have very few classroom level examples in the plan, but I think this one is a powerful one. So a school in Mississippi, there was a teacher who was teaching a leadership program, right, as a kind of a component similar to an advisory. Um, and the students were unhappy with the school announcements. And I don't know if you've uh, been in schools when the announcements were happening, but there are a lot of people who tend to be unhappy. And what the students came up with was that we think we can do better. Um, what if we created a school news program? This in and of itself is not a novel idea. You, we all know that there are school news programs run by students across, across the country, across the world. Um, and so the teacher said, well, yeah, I think we can do that, right? And so then that teacher, right? So in our AI guidance from, from OET, we talk about the importance of humans in the loop. And I think that this is a key component, right? So um, the teacher, incredibly important, said, let me help you shape that learning experience. And so they were able to leverage the tablet computers that were already available within the school. They were able to leverage a free streaming platform and a free graphics creation platform. And so they started um, their school announcements out of this kind of small leadership program that the kids were, class that the kids were involved in. Now, what happened is that other students saw this, right? It's a very public display of learning and knowledge. And the other students said, we'd like to learn how to do that too. And so then what happened was the school created a digital journalism course in response to this, the students' needs, right? So uh, this is, uh, and in the plan, we talk very closely about the co-creation and the co-design of learning, both for the adults and the and the youth in the system, right? And so this is what I would say is a co-designing of the learning and the teacher being responsive and understanding, well, this is this is aligned to the leadership goals of this course and in the and the teach and following the students and their interests to a natural conclusion of how that might work. The other example I would give is out of a, a school in an elementary school in Atlanta. And so they did the work around that that um, design divide and made sure that all of their academic sub subject teachers uh, were familiar with Stanford's design thinking process, right? So all the teachers had that same shared language and culture, right? Richard would also say language is culture and culture is language. Um, when I was at Harvard, I got to, uh, I, I did study and I was, I was in Richard's class. Uh, and so, um, so they made sure that the entire faculty had that shared language and shared culture around the design thinking process. And so when they realized that um, a local community garden was being invaded by pests, they turned to it, right? They turned to that design thinking and they helped the student, the students were worried about this, right? It's a community garden. It's a real world, real world problem. And so they leveraged the technology that was available to help kids, uh, students do some research and understand, and they learned about multiple ways of getting rid of uh, pests. And they found out that bats can eat, you know, a thousand bugs or something an hour. Um, and so then they leveraged AR and VR to help the students better understand bats and echolocation. So a lot of science concepts, right? So these are all things that the teachers were responsible for making sure the students learned and they helped, they listened to the students and they saw an, a community problem. And then they used the Tinkercad uh, software that was available within the school so that the students designed and created bat boxes to install at the school. So I think there are a number of examples of, of where this is happening. Um, and, and 
And it doesn't necessarily need to be done loudly or with purpose, but those are just examples of educators listening to students. And that isn't enough. And I think, um, Kurt, to your point, this is a conversation we need to have across all of those audiences, right? Because if we had just sent this message to teachers and then the teachers didn't have that shared professional learning experience to know what to do when the students had that question, and if we didn't talk to the in instructional technology folks to make sure that there was a shared platform of resources that were available, that Atlanta example falls apart, right? So we had uh, professional learning was important. That shared access was important. The, the student's own agency and efficacy was important. So that's where all three of these pieces become important. Um, and I think by and large, we see that the teachers are trying to help all students have those real world learning experiences. And then we have to ask, where it's not happening, where might the systems um, be improved to give everybody that space to do those things? Thank you. Susan, you have any examples? Yeah, actually, I'm going to pull out an example of uh, from the professional learning perspective. Uh, Mesa, Arizona Public Schools, uh, there's an example in the plan about uh, their, they, the team at Mesa realized that they needed if they wanted to have student learning environments uh, that uh, reflected voice and choice, that they needed to provide those same opportunities for their educators in their professional learning. So they actually worked with uh, the Arizona State University and teachers are allowed to earn badges by taking classes or they can design a learning path. Uh, to acquire and demonstrate the knowledge and skills required to earn the badge. So they can either take the classes a traditional way or they can design their own learning path. And they have different uh, specializations available and they are building more. And the other thing they did is they co-constructed their professional learning experiences with educators and administrators uh, because helping, uh, because you utilizing the principles of UDL, students, you want to help students understand who they are as learners and what does and wasn't, doesn't work for them. Well, they used that same approach with their adult learners. So by giving teachers, by exposing teachers to the same types of learning environments that they wanted the teachers to create for the students themselves, um, they were making it possible, uh, they were building educator capacity to create those kinds of learning experiences because so often uh, I think folks very often tend to duplicate what they're, you know, they will duplicate this, they'll do the same kind of learning experiences that they are used to. So by giving them the space and allowing them to realize that, yes, they have the ability to uh, choose how they're going to demonstrate their learning in order to receive this certain badge. I think that's a great example that other districts um, could be following. So I've got a comment and it might really be a question you might interpret it as a question, maybe when, when I finish it. But if you, if you don't, I have a question that does, does follow up on that comment. So I looked through this report this afternoon and was so impressed by the range. Young and I have traveled the world. Young goes to Melbourne all the time. He's a fellow, he's a professor there. He goes to China, he goes to Europe, he goes to all parts of the world. And I do the same. And people hand us reports or hand us plans, countrywide plans. We get them all the time. And when we go to Singapore, wow, this is really great stuff. But Singapore is such a small, it's a, you know, city state, basically, or, you know, it's a country, it's basically a city. They can do a lot of interesting things because they're more homogenous than in the U.S. And so when you read this report and you, you, you read about what's going on in the Alaskan communities and what's going on in Guam and what's going on in Van Meter, Iowa or Green Bay, or Maine, or Beaverton, Oregon, and every one of them has a different population uh, makeup. You know, it, it puts, it makes it rather challenging for all of you to come up with a plan that's viable, that it's encompassing and comprehensive and equitable and fair and all these things um, and meaningful you, to be so diverse and yet People can get some meaningful chunks out of it and, and, and that they can utilize. And so I applaud you for the range and you purposely embedded the problems and stories and examples 
that would showcase what's happening around the U.S. and its territories. And so, you know, that's not an easy thing to do uh, at all. It, it was um, the most important thing to do, though, Kurt. <laughs> it was. And maybe it that's, that, that, that could be broadened in the next iteration of this uh, particular report or in derivations of this report that might happen, whether it's training programs or institutes or funding initiatives that Young was mentioning, something that can, can take this and run with it, whatever way, shape, or form that might be. So I'm going to ask the question that chat PDF came up with. It asked five questions when I entered this into chat PDF, which I actually like somewhat. I like it more than chat GPT, but both of them. Um, so it says, how can various departments of education across the 50 states of the U.S. and all the territories help support school districts and schools to improve their educational technology decision making and training? Training is kind of interesting to me because I'm studying right now self-directed professional development or self-directed online professional development, uh, which is, you know, and I, I've studied MOOCs and open education uh, partly, and now I'm particularly looking at online language learning and things like that. Um, so, you know, any of that that I talked about there, would you like to comment on it um, or, or, you know, make a, you know, post what, what could be done in the future? I think you set us up for the second hour of this episode pretty well I, there. <laughs> I, I think so. I think so. If you're Susan, willing, you want to go first, you, I realize willing? I've gone first every time. I apologize for that. <laughs> That's okay. You're 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 the you're the official representative of the government, Zach. So yes, you always get to go first. <laughs> but um, I guess I would say going back to uh, a previous question you had asked about. Uh, you know, what we what would be our key messages that we would get for different audiences in Indiana. And I spoke about uh, what kind of messages I would want uh, for Indiana state leaders to understand is is to not is to help to create this the space, the policies and the funding to make this type of learning possible. And that's the challenge, because very often I feel that state policies and regulations actually make it harder to do this kind of learning. Um, whether that is uh, being very uh, strict or regimented with regard to the use of curriculum or to very uh, not giving school systems flexibility in how they're using their funding. I think that that would be something that I think is really key is to how is for one, how can we help school you know, state leaders understand that sometimes these policies have actually um, unanticipated consequences. I feel like so much about policy in, in our country is about unintended consequences. How can they understand what those unintended consequences might be in terms of uh, blocking, uh, creating these kinds of learning environments that we want for all of our students? And how can they actually act, actively create policies and funding structures that support um, these learning environments. Uh, Zach? <laughs> so before Zach jumps in here, we're only a couple of minutes left before we need to introduce the next show. And so it just, we are not Singapore. We are not Finland. We are not Hong Kong. It's a challenge to do these things, but it must be a joyful challenge to try to do something like this because a report like this is so much more important, I would think. Um, and and so, Heard a so plan. Much Heard learning. A plan like this. Plan a like this. Report. A plan like this is so much okay. more important um, Zach, and meaningful. Uh, go ahead. I, I, well, we're going to have one minute. Zach, you got about 50 seconds. Yeah. Oh, Lord. Uh, um, I think that this is the answer. The short answer is, is I hope that folks can see the adjacent possible as they look through this plan. I hope that they can look at what's going on in West Virginia and the way they're using micro grants to inspire teachers to be innovative in their practice. I hope they can look at the research out of, uh, I think, Oregon and Arizona on juvenile justice and see that educational technology can reduce recidivism for our, our incarcerated youth. I think that they look, I hope that they look at this plan and say, what is the problem that we're trying to solve locally? Because we're not a small space, but what's the problem we're trying to solve locally? And how can I find the adjacent possible in these examples and these recommendations to help us move whatever system we're in forward a little bit more than we are currently? 
Thanks for coming and thanks for volunteering to come again. Ha <laughs> ha. All right. Thanks, Kurt, uh, for inviting two wonderful guests. We've done well, an hour just has passed. Uh, we've learned a lot and I hope you'll get to read the not the report, the plan, Kurt, on the education tech NETP. You know, it's the future of uh, educational technology. So uh, very quickly, a brief introduction. Our next episode uh, is going to be post-reflection. And uh, I may not be able to join, but the three co-hosts will be there. I will be in Australia next weekend. So uh, thank you. Join us and next Saturday at noon Eastern time. Thank you and goodbye.